Food & Wine Insider is a weekly look at a $1.5 trillion industry touching every American. Visit us at foodandwineinsider.com. Three young entrepreneurs are on a mission to stimulate a year-round economy for coffee growers and workers and craft delightfully smooth tea in the process. Wise Monkeys has taken a centuries-old concept from Ethiopia and Sumatra and applied craft processes to premium coffee leaves to, re to reveal an outstandingly smooth and delicious tea that is very easy to drink, has similar caffeine levels to green tea, no bitterness, and delivers a, a host of other quality advantages. Here to talk about their company is Max Reve. Max, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Max, uh, how does coffee become tea, which I, uh, I don't understand, and uh, how do you get into it? S uh, start first with uh, um, w a little bit about your company and the local economy we're talking about. Sure. So um, essentially the, the main concept is we're using the leaf that is typically discarded about nine months out of the year during the off season and we've trained the farmers to actually process it like a traditional tea uh, that involves you know oxidation a bit of fermentation dry roasting things like that so uh, that's like the kind of global concept and it's been it's been consumed for hundreds of years out of ethiopia and parts of indonesia the difference is that no one's taken an, a real craft process to it it's just been sun dried and brewed and there's reports, you know, in the 1800s of Europeans discovering this, but they found that the tea was very, very bitter or very dry, and that's because no one processed it. They never took it, you know, to the next level to reveal its flavor. So we, we thought that, you know, we had a hunch um, about this idea. Essentially, everything started during a master's uh, in France. So I'm from Vancouver. After a couple of years working in finance, after my undergrad, I, I just – couldn't do it anymore. I was fed up with my job and, and uh, sold everything, went to France. I made a friend of mine in my program who's now my, my co-founder, and, uh, and we just fell on a, a study showing the, the quality or rather of the health benefits of the coffee leaf and how it's been consumed for so long, but again, never innovated. And so we just thought it was an interesting idea to begin with as a, as a project. And uh, lo and behold, the more research we did, we just fell in love with the idea. And um, sure enough, at the end of the year, we, we decided, you know what, it's not worth trying to get an internship right now. Um, this was in 2013 when uh, in Europe, the economy was basically just hitting a wall. And we decided to say, you know what, let's just get our credit cards and see what we can get together and go down to Nicaragua and, and find a farmer to get started with. So that, that was a whole other journey in itself. That's, that's interesting. Out of necessity becomes something new. But, uh, but so I understand you're taking the coffee leaf and t turning it into a tea. Am I hearing that right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, I probably in that introduction uh, uh, confused our listeners. So you 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 you're in fact going to Nicaragua, uh, convincing people uh, the farmers there to d take something they discard and uh, create a tea out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And um you know, you should have seen you should have seen the people's faces when they first brought this to to their attention. You know, being two uh young gringos, uh telling them that they can do something with something that they've completely overlooked, they never even thought it had any sort of value whatsoever. You know, you some some guys would look at us and start, you know, drooling at the at the idea of making tons of money and, and they would offer to like basically like shave their whole farm and just give us all the leaves. And we, you know, we would tell them like, listen, that, that's obviously not viable. It's not sustainable to do that. Um, those were, those were some of the farmers that were, let's say less organized. Um, you know, their farms were organic because they were neglected kind of thing. Um, but eventually as we met enough people and spent enough time down there, uh, we ran into uh, our eventual co-founder as well, um, named Enrique and he's from uh, Madagalpa, Nicaragua. Uh, his farm is just mind blowing, and so the the level of quality and the the ethical aspect is just something that we had never seen before. 
and uh, he was also recommended to us by the by the government of Nicaragua. So it ended up being a, a fantastic partnership, and and so we brought him into the company, and that way we're we're all equal parts, uh, all three of us. That way, it's just you know we just focus on on getting this together. We don't have any sort of like bias or anything, right? So yeah, it just it just after spending enough time down there, we you know you meet enough people in the coffee industry and people start listening and, and as soon as you start making a few samples and, and giving them a taste of what it is or what it can be, then they start to, you know, take it a bit more seriously, especially when you get some sales in the U S and, uh, and online, then all of a sudden they start to listen. But in the beginning, it was definitely a bit of a challenge to get some attention. I'm going to turn it over now to Ann Daw. She's a uh, past president of the specialty F- food association and an industry v- veteran. And she's certainly going to understand this, much better than I do, I, I do, but it's fascinating. And it's all yours. Thanks, Don. And Max, uh, welcome to the program. You were talking about your earlier history, which actually seems pretty recent to me. Um, I understand you were a professional ice hockey player in France for a bit of time. Uh, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about that journey that you made uh i was really fascinated by the fact that you just sort of came upon this it was a um a school project maybe and you turned into something really quite special so talk a little bit more about that yeah sure so essentially um i i grew up playing hockey my whole life and um i i grew up you know, I think when I was 13, I uh, I blew my ACL and I did it again like three years in a row, basically. So my uh, my adolescent career in hockey was pretty much put on hold. And uh, eventually just, you know, I went to university and I, uh, I eventually came back to Vancouver. And as I started working with uh, freelance, doing some marketing stuff for a friend of mine who had a gym, um, I just kind of started training um, as a trade for, for work hours, I would just get some free training. And so I kind of fell back into the swing of things with hockey and I didn't really expect that to be honest. I actually took some time off when I was in university. And, um, eventually when I started looking at going to school somewhere, trying to find, you know, a new path, something that's a bit more fulfilling than, than working in finance where I was, I, I found, um, the city of Bordeaux. It had, uh, one of the highest rated international business programs, and uh and masters programs in europe and uh started looking at the hockey team locally to see you know what the scene is like or what's available and i found that the only team that was there at least that i could find was a a a division one pro team and immediately i was like okay well this is you know a whole different step but once i started looking at the video of the games and whatnot and the caliber i was like you know what if i actually train like i'm pretty sure all my friends play this similar level so I decided just, you know, it would be a, a fun uh, a fun project, let's say, to uh to try and get back into some game shape. <laughs> and so I just trained my my uh my brain out uh all the way until August and uh I went out there for a tryout. So I ended up doing the the camp for about 6 weeks there. Um I had a blast doing it. I didn't secure a contract unfortunately, but I I played a few games and it was a ton of fun. Um, I, and I eventually played on a national roller hockey team and I'm, I'm just glad I did that whole experience because it got me, it got me into France. It got me a network locally is, you know, as soon as you get on the team, you have 20 best friends basically. And you know, what's really funny is that being a Canadian out there, when you play hockey, it's like, it's like, you know, for example, we have the white caps MLS hockey in Vancouver. It's like if we just got a Brazilian soccer player showed up to Vancouver, everyone's going to freak out because it's like the, you know, the mecca of soccer. So when you have a Canadian guy who plays hockey and goes to France, all of a sudden the locals get really excited about it, even though, you know, I'm nothing to write home about. So uh, it was just a great experience, and it was a great way to, to kind of get into the community there uh, and meet some fantastic people. I still have some best friends that I've met through that that I keep I keep in touch with now, and and uh, basically, I found my apartment through that, thankfully. Um, but yeah, so I was, as the, as you know, the hockey thing, I, I went early before the master's program started for this, for the hockey. Um, and then eventually, once the school started, you know, obviously, I had to get pretty focused on that. Um, and that just became my, my primary kind of uh, activity, obviously. And it, it was just kind of a, a nice thing to have because, 
you know, you immediately have this great network on the weekends. You get to go travel around the country and play in different towns and, and just kind of learn everything about, about the game. It's totally different there. People way people look at it and, and kind of treat it. So, um, yeah, it was just like a great experience that I'm, I'm glad I, I kind of pushed myself to do it. Uh, it's something I've always kind of wanted to do and kind of a bucket list thing and got to play a few games and play in a stadium, which is really cool in front of the most people I've ever played in front of. So that was just a, just a fun overall. Max, I think that's such a wonderful story because it's just indicative of the fact that you never know where life is going to lead you, but you make certain decisions at the time that really feel right for you. And I, 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 I thank you for sharing that. I have to that's- ask you where the name wise monkey comes from. <laughs> yeah. So, we were coming up with um, a huge list of names and, and trying to find, you know, really what was, what really meant the most to us. And um, at the end of the day, we chose Wise Monkey because we figured there's, there's actually, there's five families of monkeys that live on the farm, on Enrique's farm. They're all howler monkeys. And we thought, you know, monkeys will make a collective decision. They'll usually uh, live in harmony with nature and they're clever problem solvers. So we figured, you know, what a you couldn't find a better ethos for a company that's going to be, you know, a sustainable product company that has a social impact and obviously is is bringing a, a you know solving an issue in the industry in terms of seasonality and volatility, but also bringing a great product to market. So for us, the name Wise Monkey just kind of stuck, and and we started testing it with some people and in surveys and whatnot, and it was by far the the, the clear winner. So um, you know, people thought we were really a little bit crazy at first, but uh, It just stuck, and we came up with a great logo, and and there you go. Fabulous. Could you tell our audience a little bit about the earth-to-cup vertical integration of your product line? Tell us a little bit more about that whole process. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's something that we, because the concept on its own is almost so unique that we rarely get to talk about, but what's another another point of interest in terms of how we're different from other companies is that we're actually vertically integrated with the farm owner. So, the farm owner owns uh, just as much equity as Arno or myself, and we're split into the company. And um, and that way we can do all the innovation in-house at the farm level and then ship it up directly to Vancouver where we process and package everything. That way it's a very streamlined uh, sourcing, obviously. It's completely traceable. We know where everything comes from. And we manage the entire thing, uh, the entire product from the very beginning to the very end. Um, that way it's... You know, you have you have ensure uh, you have certainty of the quality of the product. You have certainty of, of the traceability, and also we get to learn more about how how the product is managed. Um, we did it we did it out of uh, necessity in the sense that no one is really gonna like create this for us to for then you know for us just to buy it off somebody. It doesn't make any sense. We had to go in there and actually create the recipes by hand, and then train everybody at the farm level to produce it at scale. So to do that and to have you know really um, a very tight and uh, quick timeline for innovation and, and again, for product sourcing and quality, we just had to go vertically integrated. And there's there might be a handful of coffee companies in the world that are like that, and I don't think there's any tea companies that are like that. Uh, so we're, we're definitely, um, you know, fairly unique in the way that the structure works. And, you know, we talk to our farming partner on a weekly basis and just get updates on how things are going and, his sister happens to be uh, kind of the marketing wing for them, for for their coffee brand as well. So we use some media from her to kind of help help us tell the story from the farm. And uh, it's just, you know, they for us, they're like family to us. They're, they're a third generation uh, coffee family and a bit of a local dynasty. So they've kind of brought us under and, and, and now they, they just like love the whole concept. And, and they're really curious about creating all sorts of new flavors with the coffee leaf. I've also been very intrigued by your mission-driven philosophy. You've already been recognized as the best mission-based product at Expo West and Emerging Specialty Food Product of the Year Award. Fabulous. Congratulations. You dedicated all these awards to the farmers you support. Tell us about the farmers and how you work with them. Sure. So, essentially, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of the seasonality of things. So, you have a farm that operates uh, about three months out of the year to harvest. And those three months, they will range depending on elevation between December all the way to essentially end of February or beginning of March. And um, 
that's when everyone's basically working. It's like the cash season for the whole industry. And most of Latin America survives on, on the coffee harvest. So it's basically like, it's the, you know, it's the boom throughout the, the winter time that everyone makes all their, all their cash. And then the rest of the year, they have to migrate. Uh, there's only, you know, a bit of maintenance work to be done throughout the rest of the nine months. And so the majority of the families are migrating or like the father or the mother's leaving, to try and find work and bring, bring money back for the family. In Latin America, there's an, there's an average of three months a year where they go through hunger. And what they call that locally is los mesos flacos, which means the thin months, the skinny months when basically you can't really afford to eat. So obviously when we came down there, we proposed to them, hey, you know, you can harvest the leaf in the off season. They're already pruning it. They're already doing 90% of the work realistically. They're just not processing it and, and finishing it as a final product. So that was really kind of what turned their heads on it. Um, and so since then, in, since I think was it 2013, our first batch we ever created, we've just been innovating at every level and trying to create new recipe styles and, and new methods to create uh, really nice smooth flavor and complex flavor. And every single year we've had to scale in production size and also uh, make sure that every time we scale, the, the product gets better, not worse. So with you know their help with the the machinery that they have the knowledge that they have which is obviously in, you know in the tea aspect very limited because for them it's brand new for us it's still very new as well but, and so we're always learning but for them it was totally new so we had to learn sorry we had to kind of teach them about the the culture of tea in the sense of how to manage the leaf they're so used to managing the bean which is pretty robust and for example like you know, if you harvest the beans all day, you throw it in a bag, you drive it to the facility, but it's okay if it's in a bag for eight hours or nine hours. It's really not that big of a deal. Whereas if you're if you're plucking the leaf, as soon as you pluck it, it's already changing. And so you have to be pretty quick and get it to a facility and let it let it uh, you know put it on these racks because otherwise, if it sits in a bag, it's just going to start rotting. And so that was something that we had to really kind of teach people. Um, and and to that point in terms of um, you know, working with the product and being delicate with the product, the majority of the of the people that we employ are mothers and women because they pick more delicately than the men. The men just like, they just grab whatever. They don't really care a whole lot. They just want to, you know, get their money and get out. Whereas the women are really motivated to like do a good job. And cause you know, in most cases they got, they got kids to feed and, uh, and they're really, uh, they're much more um, kind of strategic in the way that they pick the leaf. And so that's taken also a couple of years to kind of suss out as what's the picking method? How do we make this efficient for everybody? Um, you know, what's the best kind of leaf to actually pick? And all sorts of these little tiny aspects, which amount to making a great product, but also having a cost efficient method to produce it. That way we can ensure that everyone, you know, can make money at the end of, at the, end of the day. Like that's a challenge too, right? Is making sure that you can not only cultivate a product efficiently, but create it efficiently make a bit of a margin that way that everyone can get paid. Cause otherwise if no one can get paid, then it's not sustainable anyways. And so why are we going to try and make impact if we can't grow the company to make more impact? So if immediately, you know, we find that it doesn't work, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't work on any sort of scale. So that was definitely a big, a big challenge um, to try and get everyone kind of up to speed on, on how you treat the leaf, you know, giving it more respect than, than it has had for the last, you know, 300 years, especially in, in Latin America where, they never really drank the, the leaf tea uh, as a staple. Whereas if you go in Ethiopia or you go in parts of Sumatra, people will be familiar with that and they'll actually they'll know all about it. So it's a, it was a totally new concept for them. And, you know, obviously with the tea world versus the coffee world, a lot, <clears throat> a lot of small details in terms of training had to go through and, and lots of steps to kind of warm people up. But now it's, it's running and going and people are just really excited to start crafting their own teas on site, which is really cool. Max, you have uh, two partners, uh, Arno Petivale and Enrique Turofino. Please talk about who has what responsibilities. Uh, what particular competencies did each of you bring to the making of the coffee leaf tea from Wise Monkey? I realize that Enrique is the third generation coffee farmer, but talk a little bit about uh, his role, your role, Arnaud's role in the in the business. 
sure thing. So um, Enrique is really the the agronomy genius. Um, he he's a he's a he's a rare breed. He's a very rare person because he's a third generation coffee farmer who you know thankfully grew up with the the means to to travel and and go get education in the U.S. So he didn't he did an agronomy degree in Nicaragua, but then traveled to Purdue and also went to uh, University of Toronto to learn finance. And he, you know, when he was younger, he really didn't know what he wanted to do. So he was kind of trying all sorts of different things. And after managing a regional bank branch in Nicaragua for about seven years, where he was uh, like giving credit and loans to mostly coffee farmers in the region, he decided that it wasn't really his passion. He wanted to go back to what his family does best, which was growing coffee. Um, and so now he's back there and, and he's absolutely, you know, he's in love with everything he does and it's it's nice to see because you can tell that he's passionate about it. So he manages the whole production and uh, and also uh, gets it ready for export and ships it up to Vancouver. So he can handle basically the entire thing uh, from his farm. We bring a container up to the farm and we pack it directly from the facility where we process all the tea. And so he handles that entire side in terms of growing and, and whatnot. And and we'll come we'll come with ideas, for example, like different methods that we've learned somewhere else that we can apply to the coffee leaf and he'll, and we'll talk to him and say, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, is this doable? Um, would this work with, uh, you know, this particular machine or, or can we do this by hand or anything like that? And he'll come up with something that's practical in terms of executing it on site. Whereas we come down with concepts. So that's essentially his role in terms of growing and exporting it up to us kind of in a global sense. Um, Arno, he is the, he's the, the logistical, and administrative and sales workhorse. Um, <laughs> I have tremendous respect for Arno because he just like he just never stops working, um, and he's incredibly good at, at managing, you know, hundreds of relationships at once and dealing with ridiculously complex, you know, paperwork and legal and and all the the sales aspects that sometimes I just honestly don't have the patience for. Um, it's not exactly my my field of uh, expertise, and also. Um, I do more of the marketing stuff. So he handles a lot of the uh, logistics, finance, and, and more technical aspects of the company as, as the chief operations officer. And, uh, and I handle essentially everything marketing related, um, you know, public relations, uh, public relations, design, packaging design, uh, all the media creation, uh, essentially, you know, being the, the front end of the business the back end of the business being Arno, and then the growing aspect would be Enrique. So we, we kind of have the three pillars uh, taken care of that way. Excellent. Um, as the marketing guy, um, I think you are in lots of stores across Canada, and I think you recently introduced to 300 stores in the U.S. What have been the key challenges you've faced in bringing your unique product to the market? Um, how do you, uh, Part of that question is how do you want retailers and consumers to think about about wise monkey well what will they drink this instead of what benefits does it have you know how do you how do you talk about this product and and then logistically what's the key challenges you're facing so one of the the question we always get is and it's it's something that is is almost kind of a funny joke (laughs) is oh is it coffee or is it tea and you know Obviously, that's a common question, and I know that we're using the words coffee leaf tea in session. So, essentially, you know, we're using the coffee leaf that's traditionally um, that's uh, processed traditional like traditional tea. So, it's essentially a tea but using a different leaf. That's all it is. And and for us, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, well, why use coffee leaf tea? It's too confusing to explain. And you know, I could tell them, well, is arabica leaf infusion any better? is that is that easier to understand and so for us it was just it's just better to have coffee leaf tea because once people kind of understood what the concept is they started naturally just calling it that so we just fell on that and said you know what that's what we're going to call it because people just kind of picked up that term and stuck with it so um in terms of the awareness in terms of things like you know what this would replace it really is just a new kind of a subcategory or a type of tea that offers a really great smooth flavor and complex uh, notes in the tea that is incredibly easy to use. So, for example, you can steep it for 20 minutes and it won't get bitter on you. It won't get dry or grassy or astringent like a typical tea does, and especially a black tea where it's incredibly strong in most cases. 
and some people will either throw the cup out or they'll have to add a bunch of milk and sugar to it so that it's more palatable. Whereas our product, because it's so smooth and it has, uh, it's very light in tannins, it doesn't have that bitterness, bitterness or astringency, um, which, which on the innovation side is fantastic because we can blend it with lots of different flavors because it already has a really nice balanced profile to it. It's not a super grassy flavor that we have to add a bunch of, you know, fruit flavor to it to kind of mask it. And again, you can steep it super long. You can steep it twice, three times, and you still get some great flavor at the end. So it's, it's the ease of use of, you know, putting your steeping on autopilot in a sense where you just don't have to worry about it. And it tastes great all the time. It's light in caffeine, like a green tea. So I would say that if anything, you know, if we were out there to replace something, if that was really like, if I had to kind of put it in a box, I would say probably some green teas out there for sure. It's similar in caffeine level and our product is just incredibly smooth. And then even some black teas, you know, our product is in terms of the processing spectrum, if you were to go from a green tea to a black tea, we're kind of like a lighter black tea in the processing. Um, but a lot of people say that, oh, it tastes like green tea. And so it really depends on on what you're used to in the tea world if you want to draw sort of a, a benchmark. Um, but yeah, it's, it, you know, it's just, it's really versatile, which is incredibly interesting. And so to start with, we have this kind of a light black tea product that we're launching right now across the U.S. But generally speaking, the leaf itself provides this incredible platform to create all sorts of different teas, you know, all, all depending on the processing method that you give it. So we've done versions that were like a Japanese steamed green tea that were incredible. And we've done other versions where they're incredibly dark black tea where you have the infusion is like red and the, and the flavor is like kind of nutty and like a cherry, cherry sweetness. It's just incredible. So the range is super wide and there's lots of innovation to do there. But for now, we're just starting with what we have. And, and it's kind of like our, our, our crowd pleasing product right now. Everyone just loves this flavor because it's so smooth, so balanced and, uh, and just kind of, again, easy to use versus a regular, a regular tea. You have to be really specific with steeping times. So if, I'm a consumer and I say, okay, the reason I should drink Wise Monkey is because, how would you finish that sentence? Well, there's a few different things depending on, on what you like. So you could have one, I drink it because it's very rich in antioxidants, helps to reduce uh, cholesterol, regulate blood pressure, and also um, helps to reduce inflammation. So there's some, some nice health benefits associated with that because it has some really unique compounds in there that aren't found anywhere else. So there's a the health aspect. Or someone says, I like drink Wise Monkey because it tastes so good, and I know that I'm making a direct impact in someone's life. And so that's, really, that's what's really cool about the, direct, uh, the uh, vertical integration is because when you're buying the product, you'll, you'll see inside the box, you generated 32 minutes of work just for harvesting for somebody that wouldn't have the work otherwise. So you know that you're actually making a direct impact. And, and that's really important today because, you know, part of the reason why we called it Wise Monkey for us, it was like, wise people make wise decisions. You know, wise people will buy wise products, knowing that it has an impact that's positive in this world versus just buying something because some company wants to sell it to you. You know, and, and so today with, you know, all the, all the stuff that's happening in the world and politics and all this stuff, it's nice to know that at least you can make you can make an impact somewhere, and you know in a lot of cases you can vote with your dollars. And so, it's, it's some people love it because not only it tastes good but because it has social impact. Or other people love it because it tastes great and it has a lot of health benefits. So it's kind of a win-win-win, and it really depends on on what your particular priority or your particular interest is in the product. So I would recommend people to just go check it out, and that way they can kind of find out you know what they really love about it, and, uh, and it just kind of goes from there. That's terrific, Max, and it was a perfect, perfect answer. What, what do you hope for for the future for Wise Monkey? You know, it's, people ask us that all the time, like, you know, where do you want to be in three years or five years and all this? Um, at the end of the day, we just want to go innovate and just create awesome products out of the coffee leaf, you know? Because we know that as soon as we have any sort of success here, then we're creating impact at the farm level that for the industry is completely revolutionary. So, you know, we've already created this wave that started. And so people are picking this up around the world now. And there's about like five to 10 small brands that are, you know, just like us three, four years ago that are just starting out. 
And um, it's really cool to see that other people are picking it up because it means that we're doing something that's good, you know, and they're, and they're recognizing not only that you can make a really great product from it, but you can help a lot of people in need that typically wouldn't have that, that opportunity. So for us, you know, people might ask us like, Oh, what's like the dollar figure or whatever. And honestly, it's, it's the dollar figure is irrelevant because that's not what's driving the company. And that's not what's going to be our measuring stick. It's more about creating a, a, a globally, uh, globally growing kind of subcategory of the tea world that operates within the coffee world. And, and at least, you know, at least we can be kind of the first ones that really got this, you know, got the idea out in the market and, and really brought it to fruition. And I think that's, you know, probably the most interesting thing is, this is the fact that we got, you know, we had the opportunity to kind of do it first. And, and now we kind of have a bit of a, a, a bit of a head start to innovate new products. And so at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's really just a matter of, of creating awesome teas from the coffee leaf and, and playing with the processing, getting really creative. You know, we can do things like smoked teas. We can do things like aged teas. We can do barrel aged teas. I mean, the list is goes on and on. Like we can create a matcha, you know, if we want from a, from a Japanese, style uh steamed coffee leaf so there's tons of different products we can create and right now we're just barely scratching the surface so in terms of the future for us you know we'd love to be selling around the world and all this stuff you know being kind of launched through distributors in different markets we sell right now uh, to over 40 countries through the website but beyond that it's really about creating fantastic teas that we know is creating a huge tangible impact in areas where they're really you know they're really trying to get something year round that they can rely on versus having to have this constantly seasonal product and always migrating and kind of disrupting communities and, you know, pulling kids out of school all the time to then go back into another school. And eventually they just drop out by the age 11 because they just can't keep up with anything. So it's, uh, it's something that we see being a huge fix for, for what is a big challenge in the coffee industry. And also with climate change now, beans are becoming increasingly more difficult to grow and more expensive. So we think that the leaf is going to be a potential parachute for millions of coffee farmers that are now, you know, struggling to produce something, you know, if they're below a thousand meters elevation. So there's, there's that whole aspect as well into the climate change. You know, this could be a huge fix for the impending crisis that's already starting to happen. So there's, you know, obviously there's a lot going on in there, but um, we feel that the coffee leaf has just this incredible potential that we just haven't even seen the, the full, uh, the full extent of yet. Max, I think what you're doing is incredibly inspirational, and I really thank you for being on the program today and telling your story. Don, I'm going to turn it back to you. We've been we've been talking with Max Rivet, Rive of Wise Monkey. A link to his website will be on www.foodandwineinsider.com tonight. Max, thank you so much for being with us. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2hsa.com. That's 2hsa.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail-Proof Strategies for Small Business. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. Bob Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. When I was at a recent luxury product show, there was a standout standout wide wine grouping called Love Wine. Uh, I was to, I'm not a wine connoisseur, but I was talking to other people there who were, who said that the the, the company uh, and the wine was absolutely first rate. And we have with us today the president of that company, Constantin Zampirescu. Welcome to the show, and tell us how you pronounce your last name. Uh, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to your show. My name is Constantin Zampirescu. I'm the president and CEO at Vidalco International, 
And the correct pronunciation is Zamfirescu. Constantine, um, I think our listeners would love to hear your story. Uh, where did this love of wine come from? Uh, the love of wines, we produced them in uh, Spain, in the main growing region in the world uh, called Castilla La Mancha. And the wines are produced in a very small denomination of that region called Vino Tierra de Castilla. Uh, the wines uh, are um, excellent in terms of uh, quality, price, uh, a good value for everyday uh, wine consumption uh, for our uh, consumers. You know, it's one thing to love drinking wine, but it's quite another to have a passion for it and a deep appreciation for it. How did that happen for you? Um, this is something that uh, I will say uh, it's on my uh, blood, on my vein. Uh, since I was very little, I was uh, growing uh, at my uh, grandparents' um, uh, family estate in the uh, southern part of Romania, where uh, they uh, used to own a lot of land, and uh, the land also uh, had uh, the vineyard, winery, distillery, and uh, of course, when you have access to such a uh, uh, delicate uh, things in life, uh, they enhance your uh, lifestyle uh, as well. And uh, uh, by the time I was growing, I was uh, just um, getting um, in contact with uh, these wonderful things. Uh, and uh, I was consider myself wine being uh, a part of uh, my future education, part of my uh, celebratory things in life. And uh, I uh, decided that one day when I was in university to explore uh, an opportunity to rebound the family heritage. And I opened a wine company, which I um, um, lead for a few years in Europe before uh, moving to United States in 1995. And um, in the uh, United States, I have to wait for a little bit to be able to obtain my uh, uh, citizenship and uh, be able to uh, start importing and uh, distributing wines at the national uh, level. And uh, from here, uh, from there, actually, I uh, start growing little by little. And uh, recently, we uh, produced this uh, Love Wines, which is a project, a new project in my company portfolio for the last uh, uh, two and a half, three years. Wonderful. You, I want to pick up on that a little bit. You named your wine Love Wines. While it might seem a little obvious, could you share why you chose this name? Uh, yes, I named the Love um for one particular reason, um, it's actually a little bit of a story behind the name. About uh, two and a half, uh, three years ago, when I was start uh, talking with my uh, uh, partner producer in uh, Spain, uh, we decided to import a line of wine that uh, during the negotiation, the brand uh, create for me a little bit of uh, conflicting on controlling the brand into the U.S. market. And um, when we realized this, uh, I uh, was uh, in a situation to uh, generate uh, a brand name for, uh, for our product. And uh, at the time, I was traveling in Italy. I was in uh, Sicily, in a beautiful uh, part of Marsala. And um, I was uh, just uh, wondering around how should I call the wines and uh, just walking on uh, beautiful old streets of Marsala, you know, surrounded by uh, uh, history and tradition. I uh, walked into one of uh, a restaurant that had a very nice uh, little uh, cellar and I started looking around and I noticed that all the wines were named by different names, uh, numbers, uh, 
symbols, you name it. And um, I said, what will be the most appropriate wine for someone to really remember and really enjoy and uh, uh, become unforgettable? And um, I left uh, uh, that uh, little cellar with uh, this thought in mind. And as soon as I step outside, I said, why should I uh, call the, how, how would be if I would call the wines love? And uh, this is how I came up with, uh, with the name. And uh, I think uh, the name uh, um, itself uh, is probably one of the most uh, used uh, word uh, in the world uh, these days. And uh, everybody is seeking love at all levels possible, including wine. Well, that's a wonderful story. And thank you for sharing that. Um, could you talk a little bit of, I'm sure you have so many stories of wines that you have discovered. Uh, can you talk about one, just one in particular that uh, is, that really sticks out in your memory as having become one of your most favorite? A wine that you discovered it could be from anywhere in the world. Could you tell us that story? Uh, of course, I could do this for uh, for you and for the audience. Uh, usually, when I discover a wine, I uh, think every wine that I discover or I come across uh, have something in particular for me, uh, something that I would like to to bring to the light uh, for uh, consumer for wines uh, aficionado. Um, I think every single wine that I'm coming across have. Uh, something in particular. Of course, I cannot uh, put my attention toward all the wines. Uh, I always try to be more uh, unique side. Uh, for example, I uh, was able to come across of, uh, fantastic wines producing Lebanon in Becca Valley, one of the oldest growing region in the world. Uh, hidden treasure from Romania, for example, where a lot of wine producers from uh, um, countries like uh, France, uh, California, uh, even Australia, invest on uh, that land uh, because the microclimate is absolutely fantastic producing uh, wines uh, at a very competitive level of uh, uh, price and quality. Um, I uh, uh, very happy bringing the light uh, the wines of San Marino, which is uh, one of the smallest country in the world, but um, they make uh, really fabulous wines right near the Adriatic Sea in um, uh, Rimini, uh, on top of the uh, Titano Mountain. Um, also wines from Luxembourg, wines from. Um, uh, Portugal from a famous region of uh, Dao or uh, Vino Verde or uh, uh, Alentejo, uh, Spain, uh, Chile, Argentina. I think I have my heart uh, planted uh, or a seed planted on my heart uh, everywhere around the world uh, that I was uh, traveling and I have a particular story uh, about every single wine that it's very hard for me to pick one special, then uh, I love all the wines. <laughs> yes. So what makes for a wine expert? What does it take to be an expert? Are they born or are they made? Um, well, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> um, you have to have some natural aptitude. Some are born, some could be made uh, because we could go to school, we could learn, we could train, but when you have some uh, something in your blood, uh, adding the know-how, the knowledge uh, from other experiences, uh, uh, it's, it's a plus, uh, enhance more and more your level of professionalism, uh, you become uh, more uh, wise, uh, you have a, a faster vision, uh, you have a different feeling uh, way ahead others uh, if you possess some uh, native qualities. 
Wonderful. Um, you know, like in any industry, especially one where there's a premiumness, uh, there can sometimes be fakes that come up, come onto the market. Someone who's not really giving a proper product. Have you ever come across a fake wine, and how did you know? Um, well, here we have a different scenarios about uh, uh, these type of wines. Uh, of course, everyone could produce wines. You know, um, you could travel in some um, countries with um, uh, old tradition uh, on making wines. Uh, everyone may have a little plot behind their house. Uh, they may have a barrel. Uh, and uh, they may start producing wines for their own consumption. And this is also translated uh, to the bigger producers. You know, everyone who um, have access to, to the raw material, which are the grapes, uh, they can produce wines, you know, and uh, the wines differentiate themselves uh, based on the technology that, each use uh, the technology to set the the value, the price, the quality of the wine, uh, the uh, phytosanitary condition, the hygiene where the wines are produced, because a lot of wines uh, uh, could be produced in a very unhealthy environment. Uh, in fact, uh, it's one of my goal because I'm traveling a lot. In fact, I'm uh, uh, preparing for a trip uh, to Europe uh, to visit some of uh, those producers. And uh, it's uh, my top priority when I decide to bring these wines to the United States uh, to be sure that they are produced uh, in a very clean environment. Uh, uh, today, we talk more about sustainability. We talk more about uh, organic, biodynamic, vegan, uh, kosher wines uh, lately. Uh, and I'm looking on all these uh, details where maybe a lot of people, they don't pay attention. They are uh, looking just to have a glass of wine, may taste good for them, but you always have to look to the uh, longevity of the product, the uh, environment or the wine was created to be sure that uh, you keep the consumer healthy, the market healthy, because the more we live, the more we drink. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there are, you know, going along with what you were just talking about in terms of cleaner products, there are products on the market that now remove the sulfites from wine before you drink them. How do you feel that improves or not the, the taste of the wine? Um, I will say I'm not so sure if they remove the sulfites from the wine. I don't think we really have such a technology. Uh, in my personal view, uh, will be something that I have to look in the future. Uh, the wines, uh, even if we don't uh, add sulfites to the wines, the wines uh, uh, have sulfites itself from the skin and the grapes, which is a natural uh, sulfite. Um, are wines that uh, may have on the label no other sulfites, but this doesn't mean the wine don't have a sulfite. Uh, this is the definition, the interpretation that I uh, give myself uh, to the sulfites. Usually, um, wines that may be found in the market uh, at low price, uh, they may uh, contain uh, probably uh, a little bit uh, higher level of sulfites because they don't have such a long shelf life. And probably the producer, the area where they come from, they have to use uh, some... Uh, um, um, increase uh, um, add sulfites in order to preserve the shelf life of the wine before this is uh, purchased and consumed by the uh, masses. Okay. What then are the 
innovations in wine that you are seeing and that are coming that can in further improve the experience for consumers? Um, I think the innovation uh, is related to the to the matter uh, nature uh, in the first place. Uh, I think uh, the latest innovation and uh, upcoming innovation in the wine uh, industry uh, is to produce these wines uh, as mostly as possible in an organic environment uh, where um, the producer reduce at the lowest level uh, actually eliminating the uh, pesticides the herbicides uh, spraying chemicals on the grapes and um, um, offering uh, more and more uh, healthy product transforming the consumer environment i think this will be uh, one of the uh, innovation that I'm looking for uh, for uh, me as a wine importer, consultant, uh, producing wines in collaboration with different producers around the world, uh, is to be able to uh, bring uh, a unique uh, product uh, produced in a unique way that enhance our experiences, our lifestyle, and uh, give us an uh, unforgettable moment uh, consuming uh, a glass of uh, wine produced in a most possible natural way. So, Constantine, are you uh, working with certain um, uh, uh, vineyards to actually produce an organic wine, or are you seeing that there are certain producers that already are starting to produce organically. Currently, are uh, several producers around the world. Uh, we see uh, continuous transformation. I'm going to a different convention, different ratios, and um, we hear the word uh, more organic produce, organically produce, uh, everything related to this uh, area. Uh, also, um, I will advise the consumer uh, and I advise myself uh, as well. Uh, for example, a lot of producers say the wine is made with organically grown grapes. Uh, usually, I'm suggesting to the consumer to look a little bit deeper on this in order to improve uh, the demand for organic product because it doesn't mean if the grapes were produced in an organic environment finalizing, obtaining the final product, the wine. The wine is organic uh, as well. Uh, you can have wine with organically growing grapes, but the wine cannot be organic. And this term, organically grown grapes, could mislead the consumer thinking that they may buy an organic wine. And here could be a debate about Constantin, I just read a report that the grape harvest in France and Italy are down this year because of bad weather. Have you heard that, and do you think it will affect the price of wine for Americans? Uh, well, <laughs> it's a very hard um, uh, for me to answer. Uh, always when we have a shortage on something, regardless, regardless if it's wine, tomato, uh, gas, uh, we will always see a little bit of um, um, a friction into the market. Um, we can take uh, an example uh, of the um, uh, situation in uh, Texas when we had a, a hurricane uh, a few weeks ago when the refinery produced uh, less gas, we see a little bit uh, impact on the on the price. Uh, same thing could happen with the wine as well, uh, especially for the wines that uh, produce um, uh, very valuable wines where their uh, production was uh, reduced. For example, in some area, um, talking with people, I understood that in a Pomard area, uh, they don't have wines this year. Uh, I wasn't there to see this myself. Uh, for sure, I'll have a chance to get more information. Uh, it's an, I'll say, not an alarming uh, uh, 
situation because uh, we always could find uh, wines from um, uh, different regions to substitute till the next vintage where everybody is hoping to reach the same level uh, as previous uh, years and uh, come back to uh, drink the wines of our choice uh, if they uh, go uh, out on uh, production level. Uh, but uh, definitely according with the statistic, you are absolutely correct. Uh, we see some uh, shortage on uh, production uh, due to various uh, factors. Constantine, where would you like to go next to discover wine? And um, tell us why. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it's very hard for me to answer this question again. <laughs> but um, I want to uh, look uh, into countries that uh, they have a very small uh, world recognition uh, where they produce uh, excellent, excellent wines, uh, but uh, they've been uh, in a very small presence, uh, for example, in our market, United States. Everyone definitely wants to be in the United States market selling their product, uh, not just wine. But when it comes to wines, uh, I would like to go um, to come back, uh, to go back actually to a small country like Luxembourg, for example, or uh, Liechtenstein. Uh, I had an opportunity uh, years ago to work with a fantastic producer from um, uh, Luxembourg who make uh, absolutely uh, unforgettable wines like Riesling, uh, Pinot Gris, uh, Oxerua. Uh, I was fortunate to travel to Luxembourg about uh, six years ago, and uh, I met a producer who was sharing with me some wonderful, wonderful Pinot Noir uh, produced in uh, Liechtenstein. Uh, my focus will be to discover, to hear, to experience, and if I notice something that needs to be uh, taken into consideration, I'll be happy to uh, explore the option that I come across and uh, bring it to the United States uh, consumer. Of course, the quantity is the time that it will take to promote will not uh, give a very big impact, you know, this has been a very interesting conversation, but I'm, I'm afraid Constantine Zemperusko, uh, it, it's time for us to say good, goodbye. Constantine Zampirescu, I'm the president and CEO at Vidalco International. Thank you for inviting me to your show. Constantine, tell us your website again and how people can re reach you. Uh, my company website is www.vidalco.com and people could reach out to us uh, by calling uh, 1-304-377-1000 as well 310-854-9065. Uh, also, they could find uh, email address on uh, our website. Uh, but for our product, they can reach uh, our uh, uh, domestic network uh, from uh, restaurants, uh, wine shops, country clubs, uh, other private venues. Uh, our portfolio of wine, uh, including the love wines, uh, are uh, available uh, across the United States. If they don't have access to those wines, they could request to the retailers or they could contact us and uh, we'll make them... Uh, available and let them enjoy uh, some of our uh, wonderful wines. Constantine's company is Vidalco, V-I-D-A-L-C-O International, and his website is www.victorida.dogalpha.lemon.charlie.october.com, and his line is Love Wines. Thank you so much for being with us today. 
My pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope everyone have a great weekend and enjoy a glass of love wines. Goodbye. Thank you, Constantine. You've been listening to Food and Wine Insider with Ann Daw and Don Mazella. Contact us at foodandwineinsider.com.